Hello V1 and oh my god I'm in the same outfit I was in the best of video. Yep, I filmed on the same day, even though I didn't record on the same day, so time travel ahoy. But in all seriousness, so I can get this out quicker, because I want to pick up the pace of my episodes a little bit before summer begins, I'm talking about a game that means a lot to me, because it's the franchise that I really like, and I hope it gets represented in Smash Bros. someday, but a lot of people know about for being hard, and that's basically it. I'm gonna tell you why I think Ninja Gaiden on the NES is a well-made, masterful all piece of game design for the most part, and how the first game got me a bit anxious and excited at the same time, and basically just led me to push through one of the toughest moments of my entire life. Because to be honest, I was playing a white before a conflicting climatic moment, and if it wasn't for that game teach me a few things and mostly just to be stern. I probably would be in a bit of a weird, like, state of mind right now. Nothing too bad like the Mystery Dungeon. That changed my life way more, but you will see why when we get into Ninja Gaiden on NES. So, as some other reviews of this game already stated, Ninja Gaiden was developed as both an arcade action game and a Famicom title at around the same time. So contrary to popular belief, the NES game isn't a poor arcade game, nor was it ever meant to be. So thus, they were both meant to be separate games from the very beginning, and Ninja Gaiden was practically a series by 1988. I technically started with Ninja Gaiden 2 as my first in the series, and have yet to play the arcade title, though it's almost out on the Switch eShop. So I'm gonna stick with the older release of the NES series, and cover the other two games in the classic franchise in future episodes, along with the two NES sequels. As for what got me into this NES gem to begin with and why I wanted to make an episode on this, well it all started when in late 2012 Nintendo was doing something very strange with the 3DS Virtual Console, and that they decided that for some bizarre reason, just dump NES games onto the service and ditch the Game Boy and Game Boy Color games even though the 3DS is a handheld and NES isn't a handheld. It started in Japan back in the summer of 2012, but most people, including myself back at the time, just assumed that some of the titles that were shown off at the E3 2010 tech demo for 3D Classics would just simply be re-released as standard NES games, like how some of the Ambassador titles in 2011 were, because Nintendo killed the 3D Classics line early in 2011 because Arika found the development process too difficult. Of course, Sega would prove that as a lie a little while later, but that's another story. Needless to say, 3D Classics were dead, and games like Mario World and Mario 3 would no longer be 3D Classics as originally planned. So by October, the NES library and the 3DS was starting out in North America and Europe, and the Game Boy releases were being slowly phased out all around the world, not long after a pretty bad drought of virtual console games in general. Japan got a few things, and Europe got some stuff as well, but in mid-2012, North America got almost no virtual console games, and it took until 2013 for us to catch up on stuff Europe got ages ago. So the first NES games that were announced for North America and Europe for the NES Virtual Console were games such as Guardians and Ninja Gaiden, which were announced in the press release sent out around mid-October, and Ninja Gaiden was dated for November 8th. At first, when Guardius was announced, I remember people thought it was the Game Boy one, but when it came out as the NES one and it seemed like Game Boy games were starting to die off, we realized that Ninja Gaiden was not going to be Ninja Gaiden Shadow, but Ninja Gaiden on NES. Excited for Ninja Gaiden, I looked up some gameplay videos, watched the AVGN review constantly, and thought about how I overcome the true challenge the game was said to offer, because of how many people hyped up as one of the best action platformers on the NES. November 8th came and went with no Ninja Gaiden. It just flat out didn't show up. So I just downloaded Ninja Gaiden 2 and 3 on my Wii right before the Wii U launch to get a taste of the series and wait for the original title to hit 3DS. Sure enough, after trying out two other games in the franchise, I was pretty ready for when the original NES Ninja Gaiden came to the eShop on December 6th, nearly an entire month after it was supposed to come out of 3DS originally. They never specified why they delayed it to begin with, but it wasn't the worst delay a virtual console game I had to go through, so I was fine with it. I quickly downloaded, bought it, and began my adventure. So being familiar with trying out Ninja Gaiden 2 and 3 before I got to Ninja Gaiden 1, I was pretty quick to adjust the quirky differences between those games and this original game. 
For one, you can't climb on walls freely unless you grab a ladder, and the sword lack any upgrades to get. Besides that and a few different power-ups though, I was right at home with the first game and had little trouble being the first act and seeing some story elements. I'm gonna mostly skim over this stuff since it's fairly basic, but what it comes down to is that Ryu Hayabusa sets out to the USA in order to investigate the death of his father. Only to find out that some demon wants two demon statues to destroy the world and the CIA gets involved in wants one as well. It's kind of generic and cliche at first and doesn't even have much of anything important going on until the end of the game. And that's a stark contrast to superior storytelling the sequels which actually did get me interested in those games. So with that out of the way, let's get right back to the game. And Ninja Gaiden still controls super tightly for an NES game. The movement speed is fast, you can jump and attack right after a button press with no delay, and the sub weapons are all fun to lose. There's a fireball that shoots upward, a crappy flying star that you don't want to lose, a good flying star that you do want to lose since it's a boomerang, and the most broken one of all is a windmill attack that will make the jump attacks a saw blade that will just murder bosses in no time at all. The only problem with this weapon is that it's very easy to lose and you can run out of ammo quickly, since you have to hold down in midair to lose the normal attack while you have this weapon on you. The manual will not tell you this tip, but that's how you hold off on that and it's helpful for killing bosses. None of the early levels gave me much trouble at all, even back on my first playthrough, until I got to the stage 3 boss. This is a very, very long single screen stage, meaning that if you die at any point, including the boss, you'll be sent right back to the start of the stage. When I was playing through this for the first time, I abused the restore point feature on the 3DS like mad, even though nowadays I can figure out the pattern on the level just fine. The boss on the other hand is pretty tough, at least if you're playing this on the TV. He shoots these purple balls from time to time that are really tough to see, unless you're up close to the screen, so I had to get out my glasses down when I played this recently on a stream a while back. But once you manage to avoid those, he shouldn't be that big of an issue. Act 4 is very easy, with a jungle level that's super short, followed by a few more simple stages ending with a super easy boss fight against these two monsters. Outside of some annoying respawning enemies, there isn't way much of an issue to discuss in this stage either, so this stage didn't bug me much. Act 5 on the other hand is where things get infamously difficult. The first part isn't that bad, and it introduces a stage theme everyone thinks of when they hear about this game. It also introduces this stupid silver surfer guy that just throws a braid at you constantly, and he's a pain to deal with. 5-2 is a breather as it's an outdoor level that's not too long or challenging at all, and it's fairly easy. But 5-3 is where most people will probably feel like giving up the game, or at least it's the first major roadblock most of my friends have found as the problem. Not only does it have some very annoying enemy placement that takes a while to memorize, and the respawning here can be a giant pain, but it has this boss that for the life of me I could not figure out how to beat without restore points the first time I played this. This boss is named Mouth and he deals an insane amount of damage upon contact or his projectiles, and there seems to be no way to dodge his attacks. While I got through the fight on sheer luck the first time around with save states, the actual way you're supposed to beat him is very simple, almost deceptively and insultingly so. That just requires you to mash the crap out of that attack button and run up to him and kill him before he kills Liu. With that out of the way, the final act of the game begins, and I knew a bit of its infamacy beforehand thanks to the AVGN episode. You might have heard about this as well. The good thing about stage 6 is that 6-1 is an utter joke since it's just a long stretch of a bunch of enemies. Stage 6-2 is where some developer must have forgotten that they were trying to make a balanced game that was meant to be fun because there was enemies everywhere. Stupid flying ninjas with flying stars, enemies that try to knock you into pits, and the stage goes on for far too long. This is the one stage where a game over will set you back quite a bit, so memorization is key to survival. While I was rusty when playing this on stream recently, and I spammed restore points the first time around the 3DS version, I eventually got good enough to the point that on my replays in the years to follow from the first playthrough, I managed to beat the stage with little trouble and without using save states, mainly because it was just memorization being super careful to not make enemies spawn over a place you couldn't really hit them. In fact, I made all the way to the end of 6-3 from the beginning of the game with no save states used at all, since I tried to master this game and the sequel all the time on the 3DS and Wii U when it came on the Virtual Console for the Wii U as well. 
And while I did get really good at the sequel to the point I can beat that without cheating or losing the continue, even now, this game wasn't something I could have that honor with. In fact, I still cannot beat this game without losing some sort of safe state along the way, and the answer on where that safe state gets used lies in the final boss room. Here, Ryu learns that his father is alive but possessed by the evil demon, who's captured the evil demon statues in order to destroy the world. Ryu breaks the spell on his father after a moderately tough fight, which requires a bit of careful timing, and then Jacques himself, the big bad guy who ends up stealing the statues, attacks Ryu to awaken the demon for himself. This phase of the final boss right here is the world block for me, and why I cannot beat this game without save stating. Jockeo moves around the top of the screen from left to right, left to right, firing homing shots that you'll get hard to dodge, and if you take contact damage from him, you'll be dead in no time. Not to mention his homing frames do quite a bit of damage as well. Not only is it infuriatingly difficult to dodge his homing shots consistently, but actually hitting him is a pain due to his crappy hitbox, along with how the wall climb this game works. You can't climb all the way to the top, you have to jump off and on and off and on again just to get a chance to hit him. So I die on this fight a lot, and the reason I still use save states during this fight today is because you get sent back when you die. Not the 6 free, not even outside the boss room, not to be a 6 2, but the 6 1. It doesn't matter if you game over on this boss or just lose a life. You get booted back to the star 6 1 and have to go through the hell there 6 2 all over again just for another attempt at the boss. This setback ruins the game for a bunch of people, and I can absolutely see why. I wouldn't be that mad if 6-2 didn't exist or had as much cheap nonsense as it does now, since 6-1 and 6-3 are fairly short and easy to memorize, and you can get back there in no time with just those two levels. But this just feels like cruel padding to make the game artificially longer. Not only with stupidly difficult phase 2 to deal with, but with this extreme punishment for dying. To make Maz worse, after watching the boss cutscene once, it will not play again if you enter the womb, which means that you will not get healed at the start of boss fight if you make it all the way back, which makes the insanely difficult second phase all the more evil and near impossible. Apparently the setback was the result of a bug regarding how Ryu responds, and it was kept intact on purpose since Tecmo feared the game may be getting too easy for people who could beat it in one go, like how I kind of could. Honestly though, I think that's pretty stupid, since the sequel to this game proves that a fair and consistent challenge is the best way to handle things. Tecmo seems to have not cared about this bug much, since they also left it in the SNES Remake and in the PC Engine port, so it's unfortunately here to stay in any version you choose and there's no escape. Regardless with a bit of save stating, I make it past the second phase and fight the third and final phase, which is the demon itself with a giant head. I used to store points for this fight as well in my first playthrough, and I kinda still do when it comes to losing one to begin the battle for a checkpoint system, but this phase is much easier than the one before it. You have to cut off the head, which just falls down to deal unavoidable head damage, sorry you can't jump over it, but it's only one bar so it's no big deal. Then you have to cut off the tail as well, or you could do it first if you want me whiskey, which can hurt a lot more if you come into contact with it. Once those two things are out, you just attack its heart like crazy and dodge all the projectiles like a game of Twister. And once you destroy that heart, then you beat Ninja Gaiden on the NES. The ending is well worth the payoff in frustration too, at least in terms of a climactic story. The demon statues are lost, the castle falls apart, and Ryu's father does die after staying behind, but Ryu manages to escape the CIA agent he encountered in the beginning of the game. And after realizing that the CAA boss wanted Ryu dead so he could have the demon statues, she cuts off contact with him and the two become lovers as the sun rises. This is easily one of my favorite endings on the NES, only outdone by the game's sequel due to its practically perfect music. It's not Pokemon Mystery Dungeon level, but it's a really good ending. This was made like almost 20 years before Mystery Dungeon basically would change my life. So for an NES ending, this is really good. While the overall story didn't impact me much at the time, I actually did find the ending bits with Ryu having to get through to his father through the demon possession to stand out on a personal level. During this time in my life in late 2012, my mother and I were having a bit of a rocky relationship. Nothing too bad going on, but I always felt I had to find some way to make her drop her narcissistic traits that led to my relocation six years prior. 
since I really did want to be someone to improve my living conditions and maybe visit her off and on in my adulthood, just like how I improved my own traits I inherited during those bad living conditions. It turns out that a few weeks after I played this for the first time ever, those lessons I learned would be put to full use in a pretty personal confrontation before Christmas. Up ahead is a bit more of the unscripted, rambly part of the video, so you can skip to the ending bit near the last four minutes of the video if you aren't into me rambling, but I really do feel the story needs to be told, and even if it's a bit rambly, it's kind of important to see how this game kind of helped me in a way. So now it's time to talk about why it saved, not really saved my life because I was fine anyway, but how it helped me. So in December 2012, this was when the game came out, and it was shortly after it came out, as a matter of fact, I think the weekend of the release on the eShop, or the week after. I was visiting my birth mother in a Christmas visit, because we had organized scheduled visits. So now I'll talk more about the good times, because we had lots of good times during those visits over the years. You know, the whole bad living conditions, as I mentioned, was really not good, no excuse for that. But the living conditions... <laughs> Well, not living conditions, but the visitations were really fun and a lot of good things happened from them. So that's why I was hoping for this Christmas visit I had with my birth mother back in 2012, it would be a good time. And I thought it would be, because a week before, because we were going to meet up for Christmas, she came by when we were checking in to see this new place, because there was just therapists who were going to, you know, talk us out about problems that may help us both with all our differences and whatnot. And I thought that was good, keep an eye on us. But we talk to this new lady, and then my mom comes up and says, Oh, hi, Connor. How are you doing? I said, Oh, hey, how are you doing? You're doing good. I love you and whatnot. And she said, Oh, hey, I got some presents. I think I'm ready to give them to you next week. I was like, Okay, sure. Let's see you next week. The next week comes by. I think it's the week before uh, Christmas. So I think it's the week the 17th. I don't know when Ninja Gaiden comes out on the 3DS. I think it was the 8th of December. Don't count me on that. It's just my memory's been very foggy on the day of the release. But I know the week of the 17th, that was it. My mom and I were going to go to this uh, therapist place took place. I was playing Ninja Gaiden in Night Sky in the waiting room because Night Sky I was using as relaxation to pass time because I liked that game. And Ninja Gaiden because I just beat it and I wanted to improve myself because it was an addicting action platformer. So me and my grandma were sitting down in the waiting room and I was waiting for my mom to come. Then after I played Night Sky for a bit, my mom came, and I was playing Ninja Gaiden for a bit, and then I put my free years down and gave my grandma, and then we went, me and my mom went with the therapist to talk out about giving each other Christmas presents and just talking about what we were going to do. And, well, to keep it short and to a simple point, even though I think my mom may watch this, because I do like how you like my videos, because anyone liking my videos, even whoever who it is, I like sharing my stories. But honestly, I need to always say this, you know it's been six years and I think I did do some stupid things in that meeting. I'm just gonna say it was absolutely, the first thing that happened that made everything really bad was, uh, my mom had no Christmas presents. I was 14, yes, and Christmas isn't about presents. In fact, nowadays I don't even care about how many presents I get and all I want is really a few shop cards, maybe a game or two. But back then I just wanted all the shop cards I could get, so when I got nothing but a uh, card, like a happy Christmas card, I was very upset and I kind of cried a bit because, you know, I was 14, I was, well, upset easily. And needless to say, my mom, despite promising me a lot of stuff the week before, was like, oh no, sorry, Connor, I just couldn't afford anything, I'm sorry. And I was mad and not really happy and willing to talk much. But things were okay and whatnot, and I was like, okay, maybe we could talk about Christmas and see how the family's doing. And we did that for a bit, it was a good time. But then the therapist gave us this weird, annoying look where she grinned, like, mm. and it was like, ugh, why is she doing that? And I just didn't know why she was doing that, to be honest. But I ignored it for the most part. And then it kind of broke into an argument because I went back about, hey, I couldn't get you a present. I don't know if I got, I think I got a card, maybe something, a necklace. I don't remember. If I gave her a present, then, well, maybe she'll remind me, inevitably, but I don't know if I gave her a present. I... I probably gave her a card, so I probably wasn't, I wasn't that bit off either. But I was so mad about it, I went back to the back, talked to my grandma and get my 3DS so I could maybe play it while I'm visiting her, even though she did not like when I played my 3DS while visiting her because I wasn't paying attention to her all the time. And I told grandma that my mom didn't give me presents, and grandma said, well, the mom never really has kept forth on her promises sometimes. 
was like, well, yeah, but at least I love her. And she said, oh, yeah, that's fine. And so I went back and stuff. And then as I was talking to her, I was remembering some weird things that, like, happened as a kid. Because this was when that whole the Kirby thing I mentioned in the Deviant Dark episode was taking place. I was already on Deviant Dark making those stories at this point. And I was having flashbacks, like I said, a few months before all this. So I was doing connected dots in my head. And then I was like, Mom, are you sure you didn't pawn my games as a kid? And she was, like, denying that at first. But then I went on my grandma said that she sold my games, even though I never believed it, because why would a mom sell her kids' games? And I thought she meant the time that I did willingly give up a bunch of games to afford a Game Boy Player because I thought I could play Mario Party events with GameCube controllers. And that's a story for another time. But needless to say, I was mad at her because I thought maybe she was the reason why my copies of Melee and Double Dash have been missing and I've never been able to rebuy those games for 14 years. She eventually confessed that she did that to help the family, and I knew that she we didn't have much money for anything, so clearly they were worth nothing or she didn't spend them well, and then I just lost it. I basically was mad because of all the bad things that happened to me during those years of my life. I talked about how some of my games I really loved were stolen and I, I lost them. So I kept taking care of them, but then they kept vanishing and it made me feel bad about myself. And I was like, why would you just let me feel bad about myself instead of telling me back then or asking? I probably would have given up something if you told me. And I probably would have, not the Pokemon stuff, but Ham Ham Heartbreak? Yeah, I beat it. You could take it. I don't care. But, yeah, that just made me really upset. And then I talked about the abusive husband that she let into her lives and enabled, even though she had her own problems with him after a while, and we all fought and eventually got him kicked out. But that whole hellhole that led to me, you know, her nearly getting killed, I was like, it just all came back to me. And I was, like, so mad and irrational. And then eventually I accused her of liking the same stuff I did in my stories, a.k.a. the Kirby. Well, that wasn't true. Because I found out from flashbacks and asking my grandparents later that uh, it was the boyfriend who exposed me to the movie that kind of scarred me badly. And, well, let's just say that I will never, ever, ever think of any other place for him than hell for messing up my brain. Needless to say, that was a really bad meeting. And I was honestly mad enough and hoping for the therapist to step in maybe say hey remember the good times like any Lasha making you both happy and how you want to know how final act and then then you told mom and then everyone was happy because now she finally knew how any Lasha ended because they were on hiatus but no the therapist the stupid therapist just stared at us with this stupid grin and just did nothing. I literally shouted at her, Hey, aren't you gonna break this up and make the subject change? But she did nothing. And it made me so mad. It just made me more mad than my mom did, to be honest. And the whole thing just turned into a shit show, to be honest. Again, to be honest, I say that a lot. But yeah, it was just awful. An awful visitation. All because of stupid presents I probably didn't worry, worry about. But then my mom had the audacity to say that she would try and get me presents if she agreed to tell me something that I can't tell my grandparents, at least right away. And, well, I always would keep secrets if I need to, unless they were impractical. But this is where Ninja Guy came in, because as I was playing it, I noticed the whole story about, you know, Ryu trusting his instincts, knowing not to give the demon statue to the government agent, and that could end the world, even though he was almost about to face the world-ending beast anyway. Well, my instincts kicked in based on that game, because it was fresh in my mind, I was like, why on earth would I have to hide a secret if you just want to give me stuff you don't even have right now? And I thought, that doesn't make sense. If you had those presents, you must give them to me now. And I was being entitled and stuff, but like, seriously, why do you ask saying you give me something a week or so later if I really want it because I was really upset about it, but you want me to hide a secret? And it just didn't work out right. So I got mad. I was just flat out mad and stood my ground and said, No, I don't like what you did to me in the past. I like the good times we had together. I love you still. Please keep Jenny safe and all that. But please take responsibility as well. And the stupid therapist kept grinning at us still. And I just stormed out. Me and my grandma left. We were very mad at the therapist more than my mom. At least I was. My grandpa probably didn't like my mom much. But I was more mad at the therapist. Because of how she didn't do anything to intervene or stop the situation. And it grew so out of hand that when my mom broke down saying that, like, my old 
And the old therapist wanted my mom to have her wife terminated because of the fact that apparently she caught my mom doing something bad. One of my supervisors did not have me stay over for a night because I was hoping to stay over with my mom again like I used to as a kid. And then that stopped all of a sudden. And I found out years later it was because, well, something really bad happened and my therapist basically saved me from potential danger and also saved my mom by getting her help as well. But my mom thought she was evil, and I was like, why do you think she was evil? And she told me she wanted my wife to terminate, because that instant, I was like, well, that almost happened. I could have been hurt, and you could have been hurt. I think mean, they should have, or at least been put on hold. And, yeah, broke down, everything was a bad mess, and it was just not a fun Christmas. Christmas is supposed to be about family and stuff, but that one-on-one -on -one meeting, yeah, it was not good. It really broke me down and made me feel very bad for a bit because I had a lot of good things I wanted to talk about too, but being a 14 year old and also having flashbacks of the worst moments of my life where we both, me and my mom both, nearly died at the hands of this demon monster. Yeah, I could not excuse the idea of someone enabling him and thinking it was a good idea. Even though she clearly hated him, does not want anything to do with him, thank God. It was just a bad experience. And then the guy and email didn't really do much. It at least motivated me to stand up and at least take a stand and say, Hey, I don't think it's a good idea to basically bribe me with presents. Just tell me the truth. And sure enough, yeah. The whole story after that was basically I didn't see my mom for years on end. And I just didn't want to talk to her or bother to. Because I was like seeing her like pictures of myself saying, Oh, hey, I'm doing okay and stuff. I didn't want to trust someone who sold my games and stole them. No, not unless I get Smash Bros. maybe in Double Dash back, and even now it's not even that anymore. It's really just the fact that, I don't know, I think she should worry less about me. Just move on with her own life and be happy, because I have. And we can still visit sometimes, because we have once, because my aunt died, and we both were really sad about that. But we had a, a good meeting out of that, proving that, hey, we don't need to give each other stuff to have a good meeting. We can have a good meeting as long as, you know, we aren't dumb. And as for that therapist, we never saw her again, even for personal use, because if she didn't do anything about me and my mom fighting, oh god, she would have done nothing about me and my anxiety and wine feeling about the world ending. So with all that out of the way and that long rambly story about basically why it made me not really who I am, but basically taught me to stand up for myself in a pretty weird time in my life to say the least. Uh, Ninja Gaia on NES, yeah, I like it a lot. It wasn't the first Ninja Gaia I played, and as I said, it was just one I basically played because of the hype train. But even though the weird delay on 3DS virtual console was out of nowhere, I still enjoyed it, and I even enjoyed it when I played on the Switch a little while ago because it's on NES Online. Ninja Gaia and Tony, on the other hand, that game, as a sequel, did so much to the game that basically made the best NES game in history. I don't get to that one for quite a while, probably until Ninja Gaiden 2 is on Nintendo Switch Online service or some other way of HD, like, re-release that isn't the blurry Wii version. But I'm gonna check that out sometime, I, I aim to at least. So yeah, for now, thanks to all who watched my video on Ninja Gaiden. I hope you enjoyed this retrospective of sorts of the game and what it did for me. And next time, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have a Smash 64 episode in the works, I have a Pokemon Street Dungeon 3.8 in the works, but I need to finish the post story to do that, so who knows when that'll be, if it'll even be a season at all. And I have a bunch of smaller games I want to cover, like this Ninja Gaiden episode. So hey, let me know what you want to maybe see from me in the comments, ask if I may play it. Any Game Boy Advance, GameCube game, Wii game, I should have been aware of them at this point. Especially Game Boy Advance, I played so many first party games in that system, it's ridiculous. So yeah, suggest to me what you may want to see covered and if I grew up with it, or in the past, or recently, and I may give it a look. And of course, my Patreon and all that other stuff at the end of the video. So yeah, thanks to all who watched the video, and I say, bye!